Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. My name is Jason. I lead the delivery of our penetration testing services here at Prototech. And today's video is going to be an introduction into the ways that security can be practically introduced into your application and how this can fit into your software development lifecycle. So great for anyone looking for additional ways that they can improve the security of their application or even to help give their security program a little bit more structure and or a place to start. So starting with the basics, why is web application security important? Why even think about it? And the web has come incredibly far over the past couple of decades. We're no longer serving you know, static HTML pages to users. Applications become increasingly rich in functionality. And with that comes a whole new drove of new potential attack vectors that can be exploited. Security breaches also carry such a heavy cost, not just in terms of money, but reputational damage, and of course, a detriment to the users affected themselves. But there are still uh, those with the mindset that breaches only happen to big high profile organizations, which you see on the news. But uh, the majority of successful cyber attacks actually more often than not affect small to medium sized businesses. And these are these attacks you don't hear about as often. In some cases, the attacker might not even be targeting your organization. For example, they may be targeting one of your users or to get to another organization and your application is just a medium to meet that objective. So every application is a potential target and that's why security should be baked in throughout its development, not to make it 100% secure as trying to make it 100% secure is impossible, but to reduce the overall risk that your product will become compromised and to make it a less attractive target for attackers in general. So what does a secure SDLC look like? And the answer is that it's completely unique to your own SDLC and development workflow. There's no golden template that's going to fit the way you work perfectly, but there are some general ideas on practice that will help you effectively integrate security into your own SDLC. So I've split the workflow into six segments for this video. And again, it's important to note that this is not a linear process in practice. As we're developing a product in general, you may find yourself moving between segments quite a bit to get the best results. So keep it fluid and find what works best for you and the team. You'll notice that security is integrated end to end. So you should really be thinking about security from the conception of the application or from the application's new features, all the way to when they're released in production. And you may have also have heard of the concept of shift left. Uh, which draws the testing and evaluation to happen earlier in the development process to identify defects as early as possible in the application design. Focusing on security early, uh, it may require initial resource and time investment, but that investment will you know, dwarf the remediating the issues later on the application's build. So in the next few slides, we'll, we're going to explore uh, how you can integrate the security within all stages of your SDLC, uh, your workflow, and we'll also take a look at some of the resources and tools available that will help you add structure and implement security effectively. So let's jump right in. So we'll start with the governance side of things, and these are practices that are going to be more closely aligned with your organization and the people in your team rather than the application itself. And governance is important because it will underpin the entirety of your SDLC. So we'll begin with security ownership. And this really is about making every person who has a hand in the product's development accountable. So you really want to be promoting the security culture. So showing the team that the security is important to your organization and getting people talking about security. And you need to make it clear that security is not just the job of one person. Uh, but it's shared among the team and everybody has their own part to play in making sure the application is as secure as possible. You may also want to uh, designate one person as the security champion who ensures the team continue to be aligned with security objectives and can give advice to other members of the team. And closely linked to this is making sure that you know, effective security training is in place. So do members of the team have the right knowledge and skills to avoid the common security pitfalls and align with best practices? Ideally, get the team on a training or a workshop that has hands on practical elements so that they can actively try some of the techniques. And this will also help them better digest what they've learned in the theory as well. And it's also important that the team learns from previous mistakes. So if you run into a security pitfall, is this cascade to the rest of the team? And then most importantly, have, you know, if you have a new hire, do you perhaps show them examples of common security issue, issues you've identified in the past so that they can avoid the same mistakes in future? So knowledge sharing is key to ensuring that everybody's on the same page here. And moving on, it's uh, important to have effective policies and processes in place to make it clear what steps are, be, are to be followed in certain situations and to make it easy to manage access and restrictions. 
So for example, is it written down who should have access to uh, given resources and systems? Do you track who has access to these resources and systems? What if somebody was to leave the organization on bad terms? How do you, how do you know what systems they've, they have access to uh, when you need to revoke access quickly? If you haven't been keeping a log or you, you don't know what access they have, you could potentially forget to remove them from certain systems. And that now opens up a risk to an almost insider threat. So it's, it's also important that you effectively communicate the processes and policies to the team. So they also know what obligations they have, but also what is expected of them under certain situations. Lastly, we have general organization security. So you could have the most secure application in the world, but if a member of the team gets malware or gets phished or a device is compromised, then it all, could all be uh, rendered useless. That's why you know maintaining good security hygiene is so important and it's the foundation to web application security and what it's built on. So making sure the team use uh, strong passwords and more importantly, two-factor authentication is turned on wherever possible. Just a couple of things, a couple of the obvious things, uh, but you may want to develop a security baseline that looks at all the basic areas of your organization's security using something like Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus. Even if you don't go through the certification itself, the Cyber Essentials questionnaire will help you identify gaps in your security. So if you, you're not sure where to start, definitely take a look at that. Moving on to the requirement stage and right at the conception of the application or new application features, you will obviously sit down and write out your functional, maybe your non-functional requirements. And here you also need to start writing out your security requirements that the application should adhere to as well. So you want to start by defining your business objectives and maybe any compliance obligations you have. So are you holding any payment card information? Are you uh, working with the government that perhaps mandate you meet certain standards of security or perhaps you work with uh, the health services for example uh, like the nhs here in the uk so you want to have an idea of what security requirements you need to meet by default and you'll then want to define your risk profile so what is it you're trying to protect is it something sensitive if it were compromised what what impact would that would it have and who is likely to attack your app? Are nation states going to be interested in your data? Maybe not, but are t attackers motivated by money interested, potentially? All these questions go into your risk profile and it will help you build a picture of the security level that's proportional to your application. So once you have an idea of your risk profile and business obligations, you'll now start defining your security requirements. So for each functional requirement, see if you can think of any security considerations. So if, if a user, for example, can change their password, what should the user not be able to do? So they shouldn't be able to change the password of another user. Perhaps they can't enter a password that has a length of less than 12 characters. Uh, maybe they're not allowed to use a password that's in the list of the top 100 common passwords, for example. Note down as many security considerations as you can think of at this stage. The OWASP application security ver verification standard here on the right is an amazing resource for detailed security requirements and can act as a guide for best security practices here. The ASVS comes uh, in a leveling system, so it goes from one to three. So L1 being basic requirements that all applications should fulfill, and these are the, the requirements that should be in place first, and L2 being for applications that require more security, and this is the level that most applications probably will be at and L3, which is for applications that need to be a bit more locked down. It's a rough guide and not all requirements are going to be applicable to your application, but it's a great checklist to start with and it's great to run through at this stage. And lastly, like your functional requirements, you'll also want to make sure your security requirements are easily uh, measurable and testable. So you want to write them out potentially in a user story format uh, and this makes it easier to know what you know, when they've been effectively implemented and that they can be easily verified later on in the build by those who are testing the application and staging. So moving on to the application's design, and at this point you may be drawing out your data flow diagrams, defining your planned architecture and creating your architectural views for your application or new application features. And at this stage you'll begin threat modeling. And threat modeling is a massive topic in itself. We could spend hours just talking about conducting effective threat modeling, but effectively um, you're going to be decomposing the planned product to identify all the flows of data, uh, the key data assets, what, where the user might interact with the application, marking the trust boundaries and defining potential attackers. And this could be users with different levels of privilege, uh, third parties that potentially have access to the 
to the application or some level of access and even insiders so staff at your organization those maintaining the application include anyone that may touch the application or the infrastructure at any point once you have all design documentation mapped out you want to start identifying potential threats and this is where you will use a threat model such as stride which we'll take a look at shortly and once you identify these threats, you want to assign a uh, each threat a risk rating or severity. And then with that, you'll then decide which action will be, what action will be taken for each threat. So will you be implementing controls to reduce the risk posed by a potential threat? Or perhaps the risk is so low and the cost to mitigate is so high that you're willing to accept the risk? Again, this all comes down to, you know, it comes back to your risk profile. We'll take a look at your, uh, look, at, look at some resources that will help you uh, classify the risk and where you can look for potential controls as well. And again, make sure you're feeding all your findings back into the security requirements so that any controls to be implemented may be you know, converted into tickets or um, making sure that they're not missed when the functionality is verified and tested later on um, in the process. Uh, there will be massive crossover here between the requirements and design stage. And again, it's going to be completely unique to your own SDLC. So it's going to be complete fluid practice. So let's take a look at Microsoft's Stride Threat Modeling Framework. And this has been around for a long time now. It's been a couple of decades since it was initially thought of, uh, but it's, it's still as relevant today, if not more so. There are other frameworks you can also use, such as Dread and Pasta. So don't feel obligated to use Stride for your threat modeling. Have a little look around, see what works for you. Um, but for simplicity, we'll focus specifically on Stride in this video. And you can apply Stride to help you ask the right questions when threat modeling and to look at potential threats from different angles. So each letter of, str of the Stride acronym relates to a different threat category. So we have spoofing. So is the threat actor able to impersonate someone or something? So for example, could they potentially masquerade their IP address as someone else's to bypass certain rules or controls? and gain unauthorized access to certain functionality, for example. We have tampering, so whether the actor is able to manipulate data or code that they shouldn't. So for example, um, could, could they manipulate the price of a product when checking out uh, an e-commerce store um, to get an item for free. Uh, Code-related issues may come into play here, such as cross-site scripting and SQL injection as well. We have repudiation. So coming back to the e-commerce example, what if a user could uh, buy a product, receive it, and then delete any trace of the transaction, and then claim that they have never ordered the product and they have been charged an error, for example, you'd want to obviously ensure you have records that are immutable so that they couldn't you know, delete the records themselves and you have no record of this when it comes to the user's audit trail. Next, we have information disclosure. So is there a potential for confidential or sensitive information to be disclosed? So maybe a malicious user may be sniffing for unencrypted data in transit or uh, sensitive information could be revealed in error messages, for example. And the D is for denial of service. So for instance, could there be a resource that when requested, it has a lot of backend processing that could, you know, could be a lot if, if, if requested a large number of times could slow down the server and prevent it from actioning certain requests from genuine users or maybe the requests generate a lot of network traffic that prevents genuine, genuine user packets from being handled by the server. Lastly, we have elevation of privilege. So could the actor increase their privileges either laterally or horizontally to access resources that they are not authorized for? So for example, could a standard user change the password of another user to gain access to their account. So at every point where there is some kind of interaction with the application, either by an internal, external user or a third party, ask how a threat actor might be using spoofing or tampering or any of the other uh, acronyms on this uh, acronym points on this list um, to cause harm to the application or the users. You want to think of as many scenarios as possible at each point of the functionality in your data flow diagram. So go through methodically. It's impossible to think of every single threat at this stage um, that could be posed to the application, but the more items you can identify at this stage, the better foundation you'll have to work on. 
So as you start to identify the potential threats to your application, you want to make sure you're classifying these threats with a risk rating. And the reason to do this is to know for one, what to prioritize, especially if you have uh, you already have something in production and you identify potential threats that are currently there potentially. And two, to direct what actions you want to you might want to take with these threats. So as I mentioned briefly, there are some threats that may not be worth the resources required for mitigating, um, as the likelihood and impact of these threats uh, becoming material are so low. You're also going to come into contact with threats that can't be mitigated or can only be partially mitigated, uh, but the risk rate is going to help you digest these threats a bit better and focus on the more pressing issues. So again, there are a range of risk rating methodologies out there that you can use, but for our purposes, we're going to use the OWASP risk rating methodology so, uh, as it can be a bit more straightforward for this task. And the OWASP risk rating uh, calculates a risk based on the impact and likelihood of a particular threat of vulnerability. So you can use for the impact technical or business impact calculation for threat modeling. I would advise using the uh, business impact if you have a good grasp of the business objectives and obligations. And uh, you'll provide a rating for each type of impact, such as financial damage, uh, reputation damage, etc. And then you take an average of all these scores, and that will give you the low, medium, or high you see in the bottom right-hand corner. So you do the same with the likelihood, and this will also produce a low, medium, or high rating. You will then use the impact rating and the likelihood rating on the Punnett square on the top right. And wherever the ratings meet, this will give you your overall risk rating of the threat or the vulnerability. I recommend taking a look through the OWASP risk rating methodology yourself. The link will be in the description and it will explain a bit more detail around the weightings for the likelihood and impact factors. And it will give you some description that will help to match the best numbers for the calculation as well. So when you do come around to implementing certain controls and you're not sure how to prevent or uh, effectively mitigate a certain threat, definitely take a look at the OWASP cheat sheets. They are great resources where you can find uh, more information on prevention for certain types of attacks, as well as resources and topics such as threat modeling and other security areas. So definitely take a look at these as they provide really great detailed information. And now we actually start building our product. But before we can start writing our code and doing all the fun stuff, we need to consider supply chain risks. So when we talk about supply chain, uh, we think about all the third party open source libraries, frameworks and components that go into building and delivering our products. So applications nowadays are very reliant on a large number of dependencies, and that's completely fine using code and components that are already out there to be able to build process significantly. But when you're introducing dependencies and those dependencies have dependencies and so on, it can suddenly become more and more difficult to track what you're putting into your product. And the first risk to really consider, although it doesn't really happen too often, are direct supply chain attacks. So say you were building something in uh, Python and you downloaded a package, and you introduce the code into your application, it works great, the, the module does everything you want it to do, but how do you know the person who wrote this code didn't include a backdoor or some sort of malware? Unless you sit there and meticulously inspect the code, which is probably not going to be an option, or maybe use some sort of tool, you may be none the wiser. And maybe when you first implement the code, it's completely clean, but who's to say that if those maintaining this package don't have their code compromised themselves, maybe somebody gets access to, I don't know, their GitHub or even uh, one of the, the dependencies that they, their code relies on itself um, is poisoned. Um, malicious code can always be added at any time. And so you're completely reliant on the integrity of the creators and their own security. So the second and greater uh, risk posed from the software supply chain are from the vulnerabilities found in the dependencies. And guaranteed there are vulnerabilities that exist today in well-known dependencies that just haven't been discovered yet. And really there's not a lot we can do about that, but vulnerabilities are identified every day in software uh, components and the vendors are being made aware of this and they're releasing patches for these vulnerabilities. At the same time, as soon as the vulnerabilities are disclosed, you have attackers writing exploits and searching for applications where they might be able to exploit these vulnerabilities. So as soon as that patch is released, it really can be a race against time to get the patch applied before the attacker identifies that the software is vulnerable. Of course, this uh, falls on the application developers to notice that the dependencies need to be patched and to apply the patch promptly. But the real prompt problem arises with developers not having a recursive log of 
all the dependencies used in their application without keeping like a software bill of materials and knowing what exactly is in use in the application how will developers ever know or identify whether something needs to be patched a textbook example commonly brought up uh, is the equifax breach of uh, 2017 so equifax major us corporation holds a heap of sensitive data like payment card information and the breach led to over 146 million users data being leaked uh, this affected a lot of people and it was actually the result of an unpatched vulnerability in apache struts the java, java framework and uh, and that, that that was what they were using and they hadn't patched it and somebody was able to get in it was a vulnerability that was very easily patched it just hadn't been done and obviously it led to the breach impacting all those people just because of poor dependency management so what can you do to reduce your supply chain risk? Well, first and foremost, you could be uh, ideally choosing application components that are actively maintained, widely used, and have a strong community following. It's going to be really difficult to introduce uh, malicious code into software that's being watched and, and highly scrutinized by a lot of people, and developers are going to be a lot more responsive to vulnerabilities that have been identified and less likely to suddenly drop support for active fixes. You also don't want to forget about third-party APIs that are in use. Um, make sure that they are reputable and well-maintained as well. What you also want to be doing, if not already, is and it's so, so important, is to keep the uh, keep a software bill of materials for everything that goes into your application. All your dependencies, all their nested dependencies, you can use a tool such as OWASP Dependency Track, which will help you build a list of dependencies in your product for free and will actively scan for known vulnerabilities and alert you if a patch has been released. On top of this, you could use the OWASP Dependency Check, which will run a scan on your product in the file system, highlighting any known vulnerabilities in the files. Um, from the files and you can also use uh, retired retired.js which will identify uh, vulnerabilities in your javascript libraries and for any pen testers out there retired.js does also has a great burp suite plugin as well uh, just as an aside um, there is uh, no practical way to completely secure your software supply chain however doing these things and keeping up your supply chain security hygiene is going to reduce your risk significantly so you've chosen your technologies and you're keeping track of your dependencies. How do you now come round to write secure code? Um, well, ideally, hands-on training is always golden when it comes to understanding and writing secure code, but there are a number of resources online for writing secure code in your chosen language. Again, OWASP Cheat Sheets uh, is a great resource for detailed guidelines and pitfalls and how to implement functionality securely, but you can also look at the uh, CERT uh, secure coding standards when you're working with C, C++, Java and Perl. Um, Microsoft ASP.NET Core Security Guidelines is also a great resource when working with a Microsoft stack. And of course, PHP's own security documentation is a great place to start when you're working with PHP. And now we arrive at probably one of the most important parts of this list, which is the code review. And this is where you're going to use static analysis tools to scan your code for vulnerabilities. So as soon as your code is checked in, your code should be automatically scanned so that any issues can be picked up as soon as possible. And this can be um, automated with an automation server such as Bamboo and Jenkins. So be prepared to spend some time, uh, some manual time to remove false positives and address the issues found. It's not just a case of running a scan, you will have to look through the output and address it. Um, but definitely do not skip the step. You'll pick up a lot of vulnerabilities here, uh, vulnerabilities that will not always be able to see through um, dynamic analysis or uh, be able to catch through penetration testing. So definitely incorporate this into your process if you haven't already. Um, there are a number of tools out there such as check marks, uh, Coda C, Vericode and Fortify. I'm sure uh, Sneak has an offering as well. Uh, just make sure that you choose a vendor that supports your programming language. So that leads us nicely into your dynamic testing. So you now should have a stable build of your new product or release. Uh, whereas the, uh, with the static testing, you're testing the code itself. With dynamic testing, you'll be testing the application as it's running and sending requests like a user would. And like you would with functional requirements, you're going to 
use your testable security requirements to verify that they have been successfully implemented. So does the product do what you plan for from a security point of view? And can you identify any additional potential workarounds? If any of the security requirements are not met, then you may have to go back and make some tweaks. Um, but to help with these checks, you can use uh, some DAS tools such as Port Swigger's Burp Suite, which is uh, basically a dynamic testing Swiss Army knife. It's an amazing tool. And similarly, you have um, open source OSAP tool, which will do the same sort of thing. I've never used it myself as I'm very attached to Burp, but I've heard great things about OSAP, so definitely give it a look. Um, both of these tools also come with scanning functionality, although I think you might need to, you might need the paid version of uh, Burp to use a scanner, but definitely worth running a scan. You'll get a load of a load of false positives, but you might actually find something that's valuable and attackers themselves might actually use the scanner or a DAS tool. So at least you won't miss anything that they might find when they're, when, when, when they're attacking, so within your testing. So once you have your product near release, it meets all your security requirements you planned. It's been through static and dynamic testing. It's as secure as you can make it. You'll probably want to consider penetration testing. So a penetration tester is going to put themselves into the attacker's shoes and actively try to exploit the application. So identify any vulnerabilities um, to see if they can exploit them to impact the confidentiality, integrity or availability of the products. Uh, maybe change some vulnerabilities that may seem pretty benign on their own, but when used together can have a more lethal impact. And you may conduct penetration testing once or twice a year. Some organizations uh, may do penetration testing before a big release of new functionality. Again, it's really going to depend on your risk profile uh, and penetration testing can be conducted in-house. Uh, but conducting it in-house can also lead to bias, which means things go overlooked and you might, might also not have the resource that an external firm might have that specializes in testing as well. Uh, but no matter whether you do uh, penetration testing in-house or you have an external company, the de facto uh, methodology for web application testing is definitely the OWASP Web Security Testing Guide. So many companies talk a lot about uh, OWASP Top 10 and we're going to look for the OWASP Top 10, uh, but how do you systematically test the OWASP top 10? How do you ensure you're not missing anything and uh, you give sufficient coverage? And just testing against the OWASP top 10 on an ad hoc poke around is just not going to be sufficient. The OWASP Web Security Testing Guide provides guidelines for conducting, conducting a thorough test that will cover the OWASP top 10 in practice. You'll definitely need to do some additional research, research when testing, but it's a great backbone to keep you focused while testing. And you can see the uh, OWASP WSTG contents here on the right. So you finally made it to deployment. Your product or new features move into production. Everyone loves your product. Uh, but just because you finished your initial development or sprint doesn't mean that you can now just forget about security. So you need to be effectively monitoring the application for signs of compromise, just like you would monitor the application's performance. You want to make sure you're logging all important events and extrapolating only important data to help you identify real issues when you're monitoring. And just to give you some context, According to the report uh, published by IBM in 2021, it took it takes uh, organizations uh, 212 days on average to even identify that there has been a security breach. 212 days, it's almost two thirds of a year before anyone realizes that something is wrong on average, in which time a lot of things could have happened. Uh, the attacker could have exploited the application once or they could be coming back on a regular basis and everyone is none the wiser. So it's important to keep the right logs, not only to increase the chances that you can catch an attempted attack as it's taking place, but also so you can understand when something has happened and more importantly, how it happened. Uh, there would be nothing worse than to have a security breach and having no way to know how the attacker got in or how they were able to do what they did. So keeping a log of the important information such as input validation failures, um, so any like unacceptable encoding or invalid parameter values, so maybe values that shouldn't be manipulated through regular browser use. Um, any application system errors, uh, successful and unsuccessful authentication attempts, um, access control failures. There are so many key events that should be logged and what you should be logging should be baked into your security requirements so you know exactly what information you want to be collecting. I highly, highly recommend taking a look at the OWASP logging cheat sheet, which will guide you in the right direction around effective logging and monitoring and give you more information about what you probably should be logging and how you build around that. 
And finally, you want to make sure that you are continually evaluating your application security. So security is an evolving field and technologies, vulnerabilities and threats are always shifting. And as you add new features to your product, you don't know how they might affect existing functionality and whether a new vulnerability has been introduced. So try and come back to give everything a good check to make sure everything is still well secured and feedback into future security requirements in your next sprint or development window. Um, and also don't neglect the supply chain management keep on top of your dependencies, keeping them updated. Uh, you may also want to consider enrolling in a bug bounty program. I mean, if attackers are going to be looking for vulnerabilities, might as well have someone finding vulnerabilities and reporting to you first. Uh, but yes, uh, security is a continuous journey and never the destination. Keep vigilant, keep promoting a security culture and keep doing all you can with the, your resources to ensure your product is as secure as it can be. And that's it from me today. I hope you've learned something new or this video has got you thinking about your own program and how you can build more structure around your security. If you'd like to find out more about Predatech and our penetration testing services, definitely do get in touch. But for now, I wish you all a great day and good luck on your security endeavors. Take care.